Thank you to Dennis Avery. Good afternoon. I'll be your skeptic today. Our special is a cycle. It's natural and organic. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It has a little uh, ras black raspberry aftertaste. Seriously. It's a great pleasure to be here at Heartland. The uh, folks at Heartland have been valued colleagues of mine for years. I'm sorry Joe's not here. He and Jay Lair I've worked with a long time, and uh, Sam Karnick uh, been a friend and colleague even longer than that. They do excellent work, and I recommend them to you. I've, uh, I've got uh, some... What you've got was a, is a PowerPoint presentation for which we lack the power. But that's all right because I'm not really used to giving PowerPoint presentations anyway. So we'll just talk for a while. I do have some sets of key visuals that uh, are not in the PowerPoint presentation. They're, they're a bit more detailed and informative in, uh, in black and white paper. And... Uh, those of you who want copies can come up afterward and get them. Let's start out by looking broadly at this global warming phenomenon. And if this were a CO2, human CO2 driven phenomenon, it should have started when the humanity started emitting the CO2. 1940 is probably a good date. So we should have expected the warming to start about 1940 and trend upward strongly from then until now. Didn't happen. It started in 1850 and it trended up strongly until 1940. And in 1940 it started down in opposition to the soaring upward trend in human CO2 from 1979 until 1998, we had a strong upward trend in temperature. But net, net, we're about two-tenths of a degree Celsius above where we were in 1940 over a period of 65 years. And remember that each additional unit of CO2 has less climate forcing power in the laboratory experiments and when you reach saturation, there is no additional forcing from additional CO2. So total of seven or eight tenths of a degree Celsius warming since 1850, 80% of that occurred before human emitted CO2 of any consequence. How could this be? Why would this be? And that's the subject of today's presentation. Flip to your second page. The Earth has had a warming about every 1,500 years for at least the last million. And we say that based on tiny one-celled fossils from seabed sediments in a mud core that was brought up from the bottom of the Atlantic near Iceland. A lady named Maureen Ramo from Boston University, noted scientist, came out of MIT. A million years of climate history in these little one-celled fossils that vary in both uh, variety and number according to temperature. The warmings we've had have had no relationship to the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's, we've had lots of CO2 when it was cold and not very much CO2 when it was warm. And certainly, as I just pointed out to you, our recent pattern of temperature history doesn't follow the CO2 numbers. This next point I want to really emphasize because in light of what we've been hearing on them from the media, a lot of us, I, I should, this is a, a, 
exceptional audience. The ladies in my Sunday school class at Covenant Presbyterian have a hard time getting this. The warmings have been moderate and beneficial to humans. Not only to humans, but to wildlife in general. The medieval warming that extended from 950 to 1300 A.D. was known until recently as the medieval climate optimum. It's the best weather that humanity has ever recorded. The populations of Europe and India increased by 50% because they had longer growing seasons, more bright sunshine, more rainfall, it was a great time. Followed by environmental disaster, the Little Ice Age. Suddenly, storms, cloudiness. When George Washington was at Valley Forge, we keep thinking, well, you know, dead of winter in Pennsylvania must have been bad. It was worse than bad. In that winter, it is recorded that the British hauled cannon from Manhattan Island to Staten Island on the ice. Not only the weight of the cannon, but the weight of a six or eight horse team of draft horses, plus ammunition. And the somewhere in New York, they tell me there was a thermometer in that winter, and it recorded 16 degrees below zero. And it was typical for that little ice age period. And unfortunately, nature has not given us a choice of stable climate or unstable. She's given us a choice through history of warming or cooling. Almost never stayed stable. Flip the page. Ice cores as climate history. The 1,500-year climate cycle, that's a very long time. The warming phases were 700 years long. And the temperatures at the latitude of Chicago, probably 2 degrees Celsius up, 2 degrees Celsius down, 4 degrees Celsius net, over 1,500 years, it wasn't in the sagas. It wasn't in the traditions. It had been too mild and too moderate for people without thermometers and written records. But we had the benefit of modern technology. 1983, we brought up the first long ice cores from the Greenland ice cap. 250,000 years of climate temperature history recorded in the oxygen isotopes of the ice layers. And they'd expected to find the big ice ages and the warm interglacials, and they did, but superimposed through it all was this little abrupt moderate cycle persisted through the ice ages. That means it's powerful even though it's moderate. And three years after the Greenland ice cores at the other end of the Earth, down in the Antarctic, we brought up 400,000 years of ice history. And here's the 1,500-year cycle through it all. It's global. It's global. And we've now got the Antarctic cores back to 900,000 years, and the cycle is still there. In uh, the next page... You see, not very clearly on this, it shows up better in the visual on the, on the screen, the variability of the temperatures within that big cycle of ice ages. The last ice age, approximate dates, you've got a, a lot of temperature variability, and you see the 1,500-year cycle at a lower range, and then suddenly we get into the warm interglacial, and the variability is still there, but it's at the higher range. Flip to the next page, the ice match, Greenland and the Antarctic. 
That's a fabulous match for a natural phenomenon between the Antarctic ice core and the Greenland ice core. Then we go to seabed sediments and flip to the Atlantic seafloor's ice rafted debris. And this is a very famous graph. It's from a guy named Gerard Bond, who has now died. He was at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. He was the first guy to precisely pinpoint the length of this thing, 1,470 years plus or minus 10 during the ice ages. It's been more variable during the interglacial of the last 10,000 years, but a very, very regular and very abrupt kind of event, very unusual for something in nature, implying an external cause. There is no way that the graph with those shapes could be produced by an event on the earth. Uh, then you see the one-celled fossils. Those are uh, what the scientists call forams, foraminifera, the little bitty one-celled cycle, one-celled creatures that leave behind their little bitty fossils and tell us about what the sea was like when they lived. We can get the same kind of information from cave stalagmites. You see the layers, well, you see the, the uh, I'm, I'm sorry you're not seeing the lovely colors in that cave stalagmite. It, it's pinkish. Uh, but you can see the layers, and you can see the climate record from a cave in South Africa. And note I said South Africa. There's been a tendency lately for the man-made uh, alarmist to try and pretend that the the cycle's been only, well, that the medieval warming was a Europe-only event. This is a cave in South Africa, and we have cave stalagmites from every continent, plus New Zealand. We have glacier movements from every continent, plus New Zealand. New Zealand has 130 glaciers, by the way. They all say, yes, we advanced or warmed during the medieval warming, we retreated. No, I'm getting this backward. <laughs> the glaciers retreated during the medieval warming and advanced during the Little Ice Age. And the, uh, the, the pattern is, is clear from, from all, the, all the sets of proxies. Tree rings are often very good. Uh, they're betraying us lately because during the 20th century, we had a sharp increase in CO2 in the air, which acts like fertilizers to trees. So our tree rings show a spurt of either warming or fertilization during the 20th century. We have to be careful about that kind of thing. But going back through the last four or 5,000 years, particularly where we can find relic trees that were buried, as in a peat bog or in a lake bed, the, uh, the tree rings can be very informative. And you see below it uh, tree rings from Siberia uh, matched against a multi-proxy study from China, which included uh, peat bogs and uh, historical records. Um, I, th this remarkable correlation on the next page is going to be lost on you because this is all colored stuff that shows up beautifully on a slide but doesn't show up here worth a damn. The uh, solar variation, though, is extremely important. You see the sunspot numbers reflected with a lag in sea surface temperatures. Ladies and gentlemen, this is vital. Sunspots are a rough approximation of the activity of the sun. I, w I won't get into all of the factors that create that variation. They get damn near mystical. For an economist, it's the most complex thing I've ever tackled. But sunspot numbers are a good guide to what our temperatures are going to be in the future with a lag. And the reason for that is the linkage with cosmic rays. This too is complicated. 
When the sun is strong, it defends the earth from a lot of the cosmic rays that are sent to us from the various corners of the Milky Way. When the sun is weak, more of the cosmic rays get through. And when those cosmic rays get through, they blast into our atmosphere with a great deal of energy and they shatter water droplets in the atmosphere, ionizing them with an electrical charge, and they become seeds for clouds. And not just any clouds. High, icy, cirrus clouds tend to seal in heat. And the, the climate models have a terrible time dealing with clouds. The, the clouds created by the cosmic rays tend to be the low, wet, cumulus clouds and those reflect heat back into space they cool the earth extremely important they amplify the impact of a very small cycle that we're now measuring for the first time in the sun itself and not until we got satellites up beyond our own atmosphere were we able to see a tenth of a percentage point variation in the sun's irradiance. Our data don't go back very far, only about 25 years. It's too soon to talk very definitively about being able to measure that cycle, but it looks as though cosmic rays are the link that amplifies the solar impact on the Earth. And you can see that in the visual at the bottom of the Sun Climate Connection page. We're graphing cosmic rays against cloud seeding, and the sunspot numbers vary in opposition. The connection is there, but it's a negative correlation. Why don't the climate models work? The first place, they don't model clouds worth a damn, and they don't know how. They don't know how to measure them. They don't know how to vet. They don't know whether what they're measuring is a positive or a negative. And you can read that in the science chapters of even the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, the one put out in 2002. They admit they're unable to measure, mod to model the clouds effectively. Starting in 1999, NASA started telling us that they had found a massive heat vent over the warm pool of the Pacific Ocean. That's the warmest place on Earth. And apparently when the sea surface gets to 28 degrees Celsius, something happens in the atmosphere above the warm pool. The high icy cirrus clouds disappear. The rainfall becomes more efficient there are more low, wet clouds, and the sea surface cools as huge amounts of heat pass off into space. And NASA said that enough heat passed off in the 1980s and 1990s to have dealt with a redoubling of CO2 in the atmosphere. They handed this set of data to several of the major climate models and said, can your model accommodate this information? They were unable to do so. Their results, results fell short by 200 to 400%, even when they knew the answer in advance. Complete failure. Then we have another little problem, and that came up just very recently. It missed by a week of my getting it into the book. I called the publisher when this data came in that very morning. I said, I need two more paragraphs. I said, sorry, too late. Uh, NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and the picture shows you a little smart float. The guy's holding in its arms. We've got 2,500 of these miniature sending stations floating around the ocean now. For all of the time we've been trying to measure the Earth's temperature, we've had lousy data from the oceans. 
almost as bad as the days in the wooden sailing ships when we'd dip a bucket in the water and test it with a, therm with a thermometer. But in the last few years, we've had all of these smart floats out there, and the first thing they revealed to us was a massive, sudden cooling of the ocean. Between 2003 and 2005, the oceans lost 21% of the heat which they had gained in the previous 50 years of global warming. And remember, the oceans have a thousand times as much heat as the atmosphere. And NASA says their heat vent wasn't involved. The heat, we don't know where the heat went. All we know is that the carefully constructed computer models cannot accommodate this. They cannot predict it. They cannot project it. It's completely beyond their capability. Al Gore's not coping very well either. Let's talk about that. Antarctic temperatures. How many of you have seen uh, Mr. Gore's movie? I, I don't recommend it to you. But one of his principal items of information is a pair of, well, it's a graph, of temperature and CO2 in the Antarctic ice core going back 400,000 years and you see the CO2 and the temperature co-varying uh, or very, tracking right together through four different ice ages, big swings. And he leaves us with the implication that more CO2 creates more warmth. This graph, also from the Antarctic ice core, shows you the truth. The temperatures change 800 years before the CO2. And the reason for this is completely logical. The oceans hold 75 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere, and the laws of physics tell us that cold water will hold more gas than warm water. So when temperatures increase, the oceans have to give off gas to the atmosphere, and the gas they give off or the principal gas they give off, is CO2. Just below that is my favorite picture in the whole set. Mr. Gore talks about the Antarctic ice suddenly melting and raising the ocean level 20 feet. You see those blocks of ice. Those blocks of ice are flowing very slowly to the sea. And the reason that's happening is that the land in the Antarctic has a slope, the ice has weight, and over time, the modest changes in temperature down there, plus the weight of the ice, lead to this downhill flow. The reason you hear about ice blocks the size of Rhode Island falling into the ocean is that those ice blocks didn't melt on their way down. At the moment, the ice in the Antarctic ice cap is thickening because it hasn't gotten warm enough to melt down there, but it has gotten warm enough to snow. And all of that snow is being turned into additional ice. And the ice blocks keep flowing at, I'm told by scientists, the same rate they've been flowing for the last 7,000 years since the end of the last ice age got worked into the system. This uh, next visual is terrible. It was, it was going to be pretty good on the screen. The darker portions of Antarctica there show you where the ice is thickening. And then over on the western edge where there wasn't much ice to begin with, it's thinning. And that's what we've been hearing about. We've been hearing about warming on the Antarctic Peninsula. That's that little finger you see sticking up on the left side. We have not been hearing 
that the temperatures have been cooling for the last 40 years on the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is where 90% of the 90% of the world's ice is located. Back closer to home, that lovely little butterfly, it's russet colored. It's called the Edith's Checker Spot Butterfly, and it's famous in part because a lady from Stanford University has used that butterfly to predict the extinction of a million wildlife species due to global warming. The problem is that the Edith's Checker Spot is becoming locally extinct in Baja, California. How bad is that? Well, let's flip the page and you see the habitat, traditional habitat of the Edith's checker spot butterfly, which encompasses basically a third of Western North America. And you see that finger going down into Baja, California. It's getting warmer and the Edith's checker spot is moving north. We don't have the habitat pattern which is currently extending into Canada, but this is not a butterfly which has gone extinct. It's a butterfly which has moved and left a forwarding address. We hear a lot about the polar bear going extinct. They're now down to two million square miles of ice in the Arctic and we're still warming and there could be less ice in the future. In fact, those Chinese court records tell us that in 1421, China sent a naval expedition to the Arctic Ocean, which reportedly found no ice. But we still have polar bears. How in the world would a polar bear have survived without being able to sit on the ice near a blowhole for a seal to come up and be grabbed. Well, if I were a polar bear, I might think about lurking in the brush just off the beach and waiting for the seals to get tired and come up and go to sleep on that beach, whereupon I might pounce very rapidly. But what do I know? I'm not a polar bear. All I know is that we have graduate students roaming the hills and valleys of this planet and have had for the last 25 years, knowing that if they found a species which had gone extinct due to warmer temperatures, their fortunes would be made. They would be granted immediate tenure at their university. They would be in line for a full pro professorship in two years. They'd be put on the editorial board of Nature magazine. None found. They thought they had one. The golden toad of Costa Rica lived in a cloud forest up several thousand feet in the air. It's gone. But somebody deforested the slopes below the cloud forest, changed the temperatures and the moisture content of the cloud, few miles up the coast in Nicaragua, the cloud forests haven't changed. The golden toad picked the wrong mountain. Sorry about that. Famine because of global warming? Well, during the medieval warming, the population of Europe and India both expanded about 50% because they had longer growing seasons fewer untimely frosts, brighter sunshine. The reason, Sean was talking about 12,000 paintings earlier, 41 different museums, they analyzed the skies in those old paintings. And during the medieval warming, the, the skies were mostly sunny. During the Little Ice Age, they were mostly cloudy. And after 1850, they were sunny again. Those sunny skies produced better crops during the medieval warming. I've been to Europe. I've seen the castles and the cathedrals. I looked at the dates. They're all 11th, 12th, 13th century. 
the warming. Lots of food, lots of people, lots of ability to hire off-farm workers to build ritzy buildings. This last summer, I was in Siena, Italy. Lovely big cathedral, green and white marble. And next to it were the vast colonnades of a bigger cathedral. It was going to be twice as big. And they quit building it in 1300 when the weather went to hell and the Little Ice Age set in and nobody had either the food or the gratitude to build a cathedral twice as big. I probably ought to turn it over to questions. Is that right, Sean? 